Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yep, never saw it coming. And welcome to another spine-tingling episode of Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher, the radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. This segment of our show is brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. And we got some great guests coming up today. Very excited because we've got the 75th anniversary happening of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And we're going to play for you my visit from last year with Lou Conter. He just recently turned 95 years old, and he was a member of the crew of the Arizona. And he was on board the morning of that attack, December 7th, 1941. So you're going to want to catch that. And then later in the show, we're going to talk to Dr. Ken Alford. He's going to give you a very concise lesson on how to research your World War II ancestors' military records. And you're going to be amazed at how much information might be out there on your family's heroes. So listen up for that a little bit later on. Hey, don't forget to sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. It has all kinds of links to great stories and great audio and, of course, a column from me each week. It's absolutely free, and you can do that at ExtremeGenes.com. There's a little sign-up box right there in the upper right. You cannot miss it, so we hope you'll get on board with that. Oh, and by the way, you're going to want our podcast app, too. It's absolutely free. You can put it on your phone and capture all the past episodes of Extreme Genes. But right now, let's head out to Boston and talk to my good friend, David Allen Lambert. He is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. How are you, David? What's happening? Hey, Fish. A lot of things exciting are going on here in Beantown as we get ready for the holidays. But one holiday that I think every listener should be embracing is is Emma Moreno's birthday. Emma is the oldest person in the world. She just turned 117 years old recently. Wow. It's amazing to think that somebody born in 1899 is still with us in 2016. So happy 117th birthday, Emma. And now she's got to be the last person, right, on earth who was born in the 1800s? That's exactly it. She was born at the end of November in 1899 in Italy, and she is the last recorded verified person born in the 1800s. Very cool. It really is. Well, you know, speaking of things over 100 years old, you know the way sometimes we have a vacation home we don't visit or there may be a part of the house you don't get to a lot? Yeah. How about 126 years of not visiting an entire mansion? Wow. Now, where's this? Now, this is the Malplank House in the Spitalfields District of London, and this house remained really unchanged, mostly used for storage, and last was occupied 126 years ago, so nine years before Emma was born. 1890? Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. And this house has all of the fixtures, all of the things left on the shelves, the furniture left where it was. And in the 1990s, it was almost demolished, but someone came forward and they've done restoration. They've obviously cataloged everything. And you know what? If you're looking for a nice little place to retire in England, you can have <laughs> it for a mere 2.9 million pounds. Oh, very nice. That's an incredible story. One of the things, I were obviously, we're talking about Emma being 117, but names back in 1899, of course, Emma would have been a popular name. But now the most popular baby names in 2016 are finally in. And I thought I'd give you the top five for girls and boys. Sure. The top five are Sophia, Emma, ironically, Olivia, Ava, and Maya. So a lot of the old-fashioned names are still on there because they've really made a comeback in the last few years. And in fact, later down on the list of the top 10 new additions include Riley, Aria, and an old name, Charlotte. Mm. For boys, the top five are Jackson, Aiden, Lucas, Liam, and Noah. (laughs) Well, you can't get much older than Noah. Right. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) So recycled names once again. And as I told you once before, my name, David, doesn't come from anybody historic other than my sister's crush on Davy Jones of the Monkeys. Thank you, my sister Carol, once again. (laughs) (laughs) Remember we talked a couple of weeks back in regard to those letters that were mailed to Noago, Michigan, to the post office? Yes. They know who sent them now. Nancy Crambit 
is the person who mailed them to Nuago, her husband who had died some years ago, used to go to yard sales and she figured that she wanted to get them back to the family members, so why not send them back for where the soldier was from? The Smithsonian is delighted, they've interviewed her, and apparently Nancy's children and grandchildren think that she has a lot of stuff in her house because her kids keep telling her that when she's gone, they're gonna back up a dumpster to the door and load it in after Ooh. she dies. Ooh. Her response, I think, is classic. She goes, well, you better call the Smithsonian first. <laughs> That's right. So all of you who have spouses and loved ones that think you have hoarded too much genealogical stuff, just remember, any HGS will be more than happy to lighten your load someday in the future. <laughs> During the Thanksgiving break, my hometown has a rivalry. We've had it for 91 years. We had our football game. We crushed the competition 48 to nothing. Go Stoughton and Black Knights. <laughs> but I thought with all of the rally of the troops – that my tip would be something that I never thought was going to be amazing like this. I created a Facebook group called the Stoughton High School Alumni Association. In a week's time, I have over 3,100 former students wanting to restart the association with me, have an annual reunion of all the classes, and to start a scholarship fund. So my wow. tip to you, if you lost track of your old high school sweetheart or your old football buddy that you know, Try social media. There's so many millions of people out there, and just a simple search term on your high school name and an association might be enough, or either that or just start a group for your high school class before your reunion. That's my tip for this week, and I'm going to turn to AmericanAncestors.org. Every week, we give a free guest member database, and this week, we're turning to the home state of Connecticut, where our dear friend Fisher comes from. Hi. And the New Haven, Connecticut vital records from 1649 to 1850 are now available for our free guest members at AmericanAncestors.org. Well, that's about all I have for this week for you from Beantown. Talk to you next week, Fish. All right, David, thank you so much. And coming up next in three minutes, we're going to talk to a man who was on the Arizona the morning of December 7th, 1941, as we anticipate the 75th anniversary of that date that lives in infamy. Coming up on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. World, and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. 
Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. And welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth. And, of course, this is the week where we remember what happened on December 7th, 1941, the day President Roosevelt said would live in infamy, and indeed it has. And there are still heroes among us who lived through that day, and I'm very pleased and honored to have on the phone with me right now one of those heroes, Lou Conter. And Lou is in Grass Valley, California, 94 years young. How are you, Lou? Fine. Thank you. Take us back to that day, because most of us weren't even alive at the time that happened, yet alone have the ability to remember. Give us a little background about your time in the military and what brought you to Hawaii at that time. Well, I went aboard the Arizona in Long Beach in uh, the end of 1939 after three months of boot camp in San Diego. The fleet was uh, anchored in Long Beach at the time. I went to the 2nd Division and then Mexico Cook and back to the 2nd Division. And then I was transferred into the Quartermaster Gang for navigation training. And then on April 1st of 1940, the fleet left Long Beach and went to Honolulu or Pearl Harbor. And then after the exercise were done, uh, they based the fleet permanently in, in Pearl Harbor instead of Long Beach. And so then we operated from April 1st on. Half the fleet would go out for 10 days and then come back in. And then up to the end of 1940, we went to Bremen for overhaul for uh, three, two and a half months and came back to Honolulu in 1st of January of 1941. So you enlisted then during the time of the Depression, I yes? Listened. Yeah, out of high school. A lot of people did that at that time, didn't they, because of the economic yeah. situation? Well, you know, we went in the Navy for four years. We got $17 a month for the first three months, and then $21 a month to we made seamen second class, and, and $36. But we had board and room, too, and had hammocks that we slept in. We had a hook and the beams and the ship, and we slept in hammocks until after we went to overhaul. They put bunks in four high, and, of course, a lot of the guys would rather stayed in their hammocks then they got used to it. So you got three guys sleeping underneath you or something. But, uh, wow. Did you anticipate at the time that you enlisted that you might wind up going to war during those four years, or was it just, hey, here's a way to make a living? Well, no, I think that it was half and half at the time in 38, 39, but then <clears throat> after we went to Pearl Harbor in April of 40, we all knew that we were going to go to war, but we just didn't know when. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of time because, you know, we operated up and down the 180th Meridian, and we couldn't cross it because we had 14-inch guns aboard the battleships. And when the Japanese came across in the northern Pacific on December the 4th with their battleships and carriers, there was really an act of war on the 4th of December instead of waiting until the 7th because they crossed the 180th without permission and under silence. Hmm. That was the date, December 4th, that President Roosevelt got the message from the embassy in Jakarta that the uh, Japanese fleet had gone to sea and they had sent the message, East Wind Rain, which meant that Pearl Harbor was to be attacked within 72 hours. Now, what were you doing that day? December 7th, 1941, you're a young kid. You're what, 20 years old at that point? 20, 20 years old. I was uh, just took over quartermaster of the Watts. When we were in port, we are Quartermaster of the watches on the quarterdeck down by where the gangplanks are, going over to the vessel and over the Liberty boats. 
And when we're in, at sea, it's up on the bridge with the captain. Because the quartermasters do the navigation and star sights and keep the logs and things like that. So our station was between turret three and the mainmast. And you were on the Arizona the morning of the attack? Yes, when they first came over on the quarter deck, we sounded the general quarters, and the band was getting ready to play for colors at five minutes to eight. And as soon as we sounded the general quarters, they went to their battle stations, and they were all killed, the same as all of my quartermaster buddies were killed. And five minutes later, I, I would have been on the bridge with the captain, but he said to secure the quarter deck first. So we had to throw the lines off from the Arizona to the Vestal, get the Vestal away from us so we could get underway and get to sea, because... We had just come in on Friday, and we had refueled, and we had a full load of fuel and ammunition and everything else, and we had to get the vessel away from us to get away from the docks. Right. And so you were on the ship at that point. Of course, it was a panicked situation. Everybody knew it was the Japanese, and like Commander Fuqua said after the raid in his official statements, that everyone on the ship performed extraordinarily well, and there was no one individual that outlasted the other one. Because we were well trained. We'd been to sea, you know, for uh, since April 1st, 1940, practically two years. Mm -hmm. And all we did to sea was train for war with Japan right. in the Pacific. And so we were well trained, and everybody acted when uh, they went to their stations immediately. It took us 50 years to get off of the news reports and everything that the band had played in the Battle of Bands the night before, which they did not. There were a few people of the band over there watching them, but they did not play. They were going to play the following week or week after that. And the newspaper said that they were allowed to sleep in that morning. They got killed in their bunks, and none of them were killed in their bunks. They were all at their battle stations. Everybody was at their battle station by three minutes to eight. And we sounded general quarters at five minutes to eight, and it doesn't take them two to three minutes to get to their battle stations and secure all the watertight doors and everything else. And so for you that day, this attack came along. You're below deck, so you escaped harm while all your buddies were well, lost. We were on top of the deck uh, between two or three and four on the quarter deck, and that's why we were, everybody below deck practically got killed, except a few, and um, we got out of turret four. Everybody else that survived was above decks and in turret three or four. And then there were five men on the foremast above the bridge, the fire control one, after the blast that Vestal threw a line across to them, and they came down the line, and three of them got over to the Vestal, burned about 75% of their body, and oh. the other two dropped into the water. How did you escape, Lou? Well, uh, you, you never know how you escape. You're just lucky that you didn't get killed that day, too, but... We were on the quarter deck, and when Commander Fuqua got knocked out with a bomb over by turret four, and he came through and took charge, and he was our senior officer aboard, our first lieutenant. Had the people coming out of the fire, we laid him down on the deck to save him, to get him into the motor launches to the hospital, and then water started coming up on the deck, and he said, abandoned ship, it was about 20, 25 to nine, uh, 9 or something, and he said that. And, the ones that survived got over the side and into Fort Island, or else they got into the motor launches. And then we got in the motor launch and picked up bodies and parts of bodies out of the water because the whole fleet was burning. And we fought the fire on the Arizona until Tuesday, and they got out, and we took a rest for three or four days. And then we started diving on the ship to try to bring up bodies. And after five or six days, we were in shallow water helmets, and Pete Uzar was our main diver, the water tender first. And he dove in a regular suit and stayed down four, five, six hours. And we'd stay down maybe 30, 40 minutes is all in the water. Shallow water helmet with somebody pumping air in the deck. Right. But after five or six days, why, uh, Pete decided it was too dangerous. We were getting the air hoses caught on the doors and everything else. And so they called it off. And we abandoned ship, and that was it. The survivors went to other ships from base force, went to other ships to destroyers and everything that was able to go to sea. I went to Commander Base Force, and Captain Geiselman, who was our executive officer, was made provost marshal in Honolulu, because martial law was declared immediately without an environmental impact report or any other hearings, and the military took over, and Captain Geiselman was appointed provost marshal, and uh, he called Pete and I in to patrol the streets and help and anybody in Honolulu, after sunset, was restricted from going out or before sunrise or they get shot. Wow. And so I lasted there until 
first part of January, we had our orders, John, Johnson was in fifth reason, I had our orders to flight school on November the 1st, and Captain Van Valkenburg called us down and said, we're going back to Long Beach to pick up our 1.1 December the 19th, so you go back with us and go to Pensacola from there. But we lost our orders on the Arizona December 7th, so it was about the first week in January when I was over there. Hitchcock's house for dinner, Admiral Calhoun came in and said, I thought you went to flight school, and I told him we lost our orders. And it wasn't three or four days they pulled Johnny off a destroyer and myself, and we were on the Lurling back to uh, San Francisco and went to Pensacola to flight school. As He was a gunner's mate, and I was a quartermaster second class. Now let's let's talk about how this has affected your life. You were 20 years old at the time. I mean, you were just a kid. Obviously, it was a horrific thing, and I'm sure that it was more painful as you looked back on it. Talk about that a little bit, how that impacted you and your ability to function going forward through the war and since. Well, we handled it the way we were trained. We had high, hard training on site, and we handled it that way, and that's what we had to do. We knew we had to win the war and go, so we did what we had to do. And like Lauren Bruner was on the Arizona and he lives in La Mirada now, he's 95. And he was one of the ones that came off the foremast and was burned over 75% of his body. Mm. They put him to the hospital until July of 42, and he was pretty well then. And they said, you're well to go back to duty, and they put him in a destroyer, and he didn't see the United States till January 1946. Don Stratton, who was on the Arizona, got burned, in, and he spent two years in the hospital, and he came out with a medical. But he's still living in Colorado Springs, too. And John Anderson is our senior petty officer aboard. He's a boatswain mate, and he's 99 now. And his twin brother was killed in the Arizona. So uh, they have different thoughts, you know. Sure. And uh, I've learned in survival the will to live, and you've got to be positive thinking all the time, and the will to live. He's Lou Conter. He's a veteran of World War II, survived the Arizona, and being shot down over the Pacific. Sir, we thank you for your service. Thank you for your time and sharing your story with everybody. And we wish you well through your current trial with your wife's illness. Thank you very much. Wow. This segment has been brought to you by MyHeritage.com. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Dr. Ken Alford about finding the records of your World War II ancestors in five minutes on Extreme Genes. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. (laughs) 
And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, and I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm still just taking all of it in that we just heard from Lou Conter about surviving the Japanese attack on the Arizona at Pearl Harbor back on December 7th, 1941. And with that, I think it makes a lot of sense to bring on Dr. Ken Alford. He is a professor at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, to talk about researching your World War II ancestors. So many of them, I think now, Ken, are gone more than are still with us. Where do we start if we want to research our World War II ancestor? The great news is World War II was documented from beginning to end. And so listeners that have ancestors and relatives that fought in World War II are bound to find something. Uh, Unlike other wars, this is probably the best documented war we've got. And and everything is available is the good news. When you start, what you want to do is there's four key pieces of information that you want to find on your veteran. And you may not find them all in the same place. You may not find them all at the same time. But these are the four things you want first. You want to know which branch of service they were in. Second is you want to find out generally their periods of service. And you want to find out where they served. You know, were they in the Pacific? Did they stay stateside? Did they go into Europe? Were they in North Africa? And then fourth, you want to know how did they serve? What was their rank? Were they enlisted, non-commissioned officer, some kind of sergeant? Or did they serve as a warrant officer or even as a commissioned officer? Because it turns out the higher the rank, the more records you're going to find is just kind of the relationship. That makes sense, sure. Then once you do that, a lot of people think the military records are just kind of, oh, all homogenous. But there are many different kinds of records. And interestingly, especially for World War II, there are military records for people that didn't serve in the military. And I know that sounds a little bit weird, but actually what happened is it was a period of the draft in which the draft was extended very broadly. So most male ancestors will have some kind of draft registration record. And that's the first category of these records. They're called pre-service records. Okay. They're records created by the government, and the people may or may not serve. And so draft registration records, for example, my grandfather never served in World War II. He was too old, and they didn't take the draft that high, but he was in the age group where they had to register. So we've got his registration records, and they contain a wealth of information. I mean, including eye color, hair color, and height. Right. And so they're just wonderful records. The other kind of pre-service records are the documents that actually turn someone from a civilian into a soldier or a sailor or a Marine. They're enlistment documents for non-commissioned officers and enlisted, and they are commissioning documents for the officers because there are many different commissioning sources, such as ROTC, officer candidate school, direct commissions, and and so on. So those are all kind of pre-service records. The second category of records is what are called service records. And as the name implies, these are records that are generated while the people are on active duty. And there can be just a host of records, depending on how long they served, where they served, if they received awards, the orders that transferred them. And eventually, if there's discharge papers or if they were captured, all of those kinds of records are kept by the government because they're all official. That's exciting, though, to know that that's out there. The third category of records is, as you would expect, if there's a pre-service, there's going to be post-service. Post-service records contain things like a killed-in-action records or a separation or discharge because no matter when you serve or how long you serve, at some point you will leave the service, either through death or through some kind of separation or discharge. The government documents that in forms. Everyone that also served gets something called a Form DD-214, and that DD-214 is a record of your military service. It's family history gold, because what it has in just two pages is a summary of the entire service of that service member. If you only get one document from a family member who served in World War II, you want to search for that DD-214. Oh, that's good to know. Another great piece of documentation, and it's not going to be nearly as concise, (laughs) are pension papers. Yes. Because when you receive a check from the government, they're going to require a huge amount of documentation. And you can also find things in pension papers like vital record information, complete spelling of names, military units, description of service, including campaigns and battles and awards, their physical description, a description of their health, where they lived, who their heirs are. I mean, it's just... 
wonderful. And, wonderful and that really wonderful. applies to most wars of the United States. Yes. The pension records are fabulous. It does indeed. So where do you look for this information? You know, you know what you want, and you're just not sure where Grandpa served. I would recommend that listeners simply start with the obvious choices of Ancestry.com and Fold3.com. They have digitized a lot of government records, and that's the one shop where they will find more in the quickest amount of time than any of these other websites I'm going to give you. And so start there. Next, I would actually do a search for your local newspapers. If you know where Grandpa or Great Grandpa lived and went into the service from, there was probably a newspaper article generated at the time. And so many of them are digitized now on places like MyHeritage, Newspapers.com, GenealogyBank.com, also chronicling America through the Library of Congress. Absolutely. And, and many states have taken the bull by the horns and have digitized state newspapers. For right. example, for listeners that live in the state of Utah, there's a website called Utah Digital Newspapers that has many, many newspaper archives, and they're just wonderful, and they're all free. The federal government, as you would expect, since they collect all this stuff, has started making it available. It's not all digital yet, but much of it is. Let me just give your listeners some of these websites and places that I would send them to for the next round. After you've found everything you can find at Ancestry and Fold3, then go to the federal sources. I would go first to the National Archives. Right. If you go to their website, it's just archives.gov, and they have a huge wealth of information. Much of it is digitized. You can obtain these microfish and microfilm through genealogical centers across the nation. And if you're in Washington, D.C., I highly recommend a visit to the National Archives. It's free, but you can actually hold your grandfather's records in many cases in your hand. Wow. And, that's, and then you can make a copy of them there. And that's just something fun. And that's a thrill in itself, isn't it? It is a huge thrill. The next thing I would recommend is to check the National Personnel Records Center, the NPRC, at St. Louis. And you can actually yep. find it through a link off of the National Archives website. Now, the good news is if your ancestors' records are there, you will receive a folder and there are small charges that apply, but I have seen some of these that are two and three inches thick of just genealogical gold. That's the good news. The bad news is in 1973, a fire destroyed mm -hmm. 80% of their records. Yeah. And most of the World War II records, I, I just hate to say this, were, were burned. But you always try. The next place I would check is the Veterans Administration. That's va.gov. And then I would send them also to the Library of Congress, and that's just loc.gov. And the Library of Congress will not have records, but they will have photos and unit histories. Oh. And you may find Grandpa or Great Grandpa in those secondary sources. I would also encourage your listeners to go to state archives and local military museums. And lastly, I would just add before we close this off that since this is World War II, this is now really the first war in American history where we have sizable numbers of women who serve in either the waves or the wax or in auxiliary corps. And there are millions of female records as well. I wish we had more time, Ken. This is fabulous. So helpful for a lot of people. If you miss this, of course, listen again on the podcast in the coming week, and you can find out all kinds of things to write down about how to track down your World War II ancestor. Thanks for coming on, Dr. Alford. Thank you very much. And this segment's been brought to you by LegacyTree.com. Tom Perry talks preservation next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. You know, everybody needs a place of their own to plant their family tree, preferably one that no one else can mess with and only you can control. That perfect place is Roots Magic. Roots Magic has been a family history standard for years, and now Roots Magic 7 is on the market. It's an award-winning genealogical software program which makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easy. You can start from scratch or import data from other software or even family search. Roots Magic 
also automatically finds records relating to your ancestors from MyHeritage, FamilySearch, and soon Ancestry and Find My Past. You can use it to create beautiful charts, reports, and books. And have you ever thought about making your own family history website? Roots Magic can make that happen too. And of course, there are free videos, guides, and technical support to help you along. Isn't it about time you planted your family tree? Whether you're a beginning genie or experienced professional, Roots Magic is the perfect tool for you. Hey, genies, it's Fisher, and this is very exciting news from my friends at StoryWorth.com. Now, during the holidays, of course, we want to get closer to our family. Well, StoryWorth is a company that helps you do just that and preserves your family memories in the process. StoryWorth is the easiest way to record your family stories and print them in a keepsake book. Now, once you purchase a subscription for a family member, they'll receive an email each week with a question about their life. Your storyteller just replies to the email with their story and it's saved to your private account on storyworth.com and at the end of the year their stories are printed in a hardcover book ensuring their memories are saved for generations to come and right now you can take advantage of an extreme gene special twenty dollars off for the holidays you'll get a year of stories and a book for just fifty nine dollars just go to storyworth.com slash extreme that's storyworth.com slash extreme give the gift of family with storyworth have you saved the date? Roots Tech, the world's largest family history and technology conference, is coming up Wednesday, February 8th through Saturday, February 11th in Salt Lake City, Utah at the Salt Palace Convention Center. Last year's conference was attended by over 28,000 people from all over the world, there to learn more about finding, sharing, and preserving the records of their families. This year's keynote speakers include actor-producer LeVar Burton, DNA expert CC Moore, HGTV's property brothers Drew and Jonathan Scott and Cake Boss Buddy Velastro. Plus, this year's Roots Tech Expo Hall will feature over 200 exhibitors from all over the world. Sharpen your sleuthing skills with more than 200 breakout sessions covering every level of expertise discussing DNA, digital preservation, online tools, and much more. You're going to want to be part of Roots Tech 2017. Sign up now at rootstech.org, hosted by Family Search International. Hey, welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. And it's Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. This segment of our show is brought to you by RootsMagic.com. And Tom Perry is here with us from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority. Hi, Tommy. Happy holidays. Good to be here. We are really getting close now. I mean, we're talking about right down to it as far as anybody getting anything done anywhere as far as digitizing goes. Although I would assume there are some facilities that can take things later than others, depending on where you are around the country. At our place, we try to under-promise and then over-deliver. Magic isn't going to get your stuff done. You need to get (laughs) stuff put together. So we have some openings. Check with people local because that's probably going to help you as well. Now, just remember the most important tips that we want to teach you when you're choosing who is going to transfer your film or your video. And Remember... When you're doing film, you always want to have it scanned, whether it's 8 millimeter, Super 8, 16 slides, photos, anything like that. You definitely want to make sure that it's scanned because you're going to get a better quality. They ask them, say, hey, can I get JPEGs with that order? And if they say yes, then they're really scanning, even though you don't have to get the JPEGs if you don't want. But if they say, no, you can't get JPEGs as part of the scanning process, they're not really scanning. So that's a big red flag. What are they doing? Projecting it. Most people project it on a wall or they have one of those old things you had in the newsroom years and years ago that you know would do slides and everything through mirrors and then there'd be a camera that captures it and you're going to lose quality. In fact, in the old days, when we transferred film that way, because that was the only way to do it, we would tell people, hey, your film's never going to be as bright and as beautiful as it was with a 3200 watt light bulb shining through it. But nowadays we actually say, and you you can testify to this because of the film we did for you. We can actually make it brighter, make the colors more pure and more lifelike with the equipment we have today than when you used to show it on your projector. Sure, computer correction. Oh, absolutely. Well, just a process like we use LED lights now instead of a 3200 watt light bulb. So there's less damage to your film. It doesn't fade your film the same way. And it makes it a lot more brilliant. Like you can have things that as a child you remember watching and it was, you know, who is that? All I can see is kind of a silhouette with a new way where we actually scan the film. You can see who the people are and what they're doing. It may be grainy, but it doesn't matter. It's a picture and you can identify them. It makes it really, really personal. Well, what was fun for me was to actually create an entire folder of photographs 
taken from home movies. And so I wound up with 30 or 40 of them, pictures of my grandparents with me that I didn't have because they died when I was so young, or distant relatives or people in unique places. It was really fun. Oh, it is. It's so exciting to have those JPEGs and those old films. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and had no photographs of me with my grandparents. Then when I dug out my dad's old 8 millimeter films, I found all these pictures with me with my grandparents. I thought, these are treasures. I wouldn't give them up for anything. Sure, and you were able to make them into photographs. Right, because the film was scanned, and so JPEGs was an option, and of course, I made the JPEGs. Now, the next step, if you're going to do VHS to DVD, you always want to go with a real-time source. A lot of people do VHS to a computer, and then on the computer, they burn a DVD. Lots of times you're going to get all kinds of problems with that. The main reason is a computer is not a source that's made to turn stuff analog to digital. It's a piece of equipment that's made to manage digital. So you say, oh, okay, well, I can buy this little device and put between my camera and between my computer that does all the conversion. Every time you add a new piece of equipment from the original source to your final, you're going to lose some things, better chances of noise getting into it, not just audio noise, but video noise that can cause problems. So if you're going straight to DVD, you always want to make sure whoever's doing your process is doing a real-time conversion. So a two-hour tape is going to take a full two hours plus to burn onto a DVD as it's going along. It's not going onto a computer, then they're going to make an ISO of it or whatever, and then turn it into a DVD or a Blu-ray for you. You want to go straight to DVD. DVD. Now, the exception to this is if you just want to go to an MP4 or you want to go to an AVI or an MOV, then going to the computer is okay because if you go the real-time way, which we were talking about, you're going to have to take the DVD and convert it into a format that your computer will understand. So if your end use is computer, it's okay to go to a computer. If you just want a DVD, go straight to DVD. All right. Great advice as always. And coming up next in three minutes, we'll let Tom answer some listener questions on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies, it's Fisher, and this is very exciting news from my friends at StoryWorth.com. Now, during the holidays, of course, we want to get closer to our family. Well, StoryWorth is a company that helps you do just that and preserves your family memories in the process. StoryWorth is the easiest way to record your family's stories and print them in a keepsake book. Now, once you purchase a subscription for a family member, they'll receive an email each week with a question about their life. Your storyteller just replies to the email with their story and it's saved to your private account on storyworth.com and at the end of the year their stories are printed in a hardcover book ensuring their memories are saved for generations to come and right now you can take advantage of an extreme gene special twenty dollars off for the holidays you'll get a year of stories and a book for just fifty nine dollars just go to storyworth.com slash extreme that's storyworth.com slash extreme give the gift of family looking with for an easy way way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. 
AndyMcGowan.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities and it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. I got to tell you, no matter how long I've been doing this stuff, the technical things are always the most challenging. Exactly. And uh, welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It's Fisher here with Tom Perry, the preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. All right, we have emails, Tom, and a couple of interesting ones. This one is from Natchiket. I hope I got the name right. Natchiket Patil. Natchiket writes, I need to convert a Blu-ray disc to pen drive or hard disc so that I can see it on desktop. It's a wedding video of one and a half hours length. Please let me know if it's possible and how much I should expect to pay. That's a really good question. A lot of people don't think about doing things backwards so much. They think about going from analog to digital. But sometimes you're changing digital formats. And there's a lot of things we can do. There's other suppliers across the country that do the transfers and duplication like we do that can help you. Or if you want to do it yourself, there's a great program called Wondershare that will allow you to take a Blu-ray and turn it into about anything you want. You can turn it into a file for your Android, for your iPhone, for your iPad. You can turn it into something like you mentioned that you want on your desktop. Now, one thing you always want to remember when you're doing conversions and you go, well, what do I need to go to? You're always going to be safe by going to MP4s if it's a video source or MP3s because it's an audio source. Because almost every computer, almost every software out there will understand MP4s and MP3s. For instance, like when you download a video, what you're downloading is actually an MP4. So it's this video that's compressed. It's about half the size of a DVD. Right. So it downloads really fast. But yet the quality is really superior. It's absolutely wonderful. So when you're playing on your 1080p television or your 4K television, it still looks you know, really good. And so that's the joy about MP4s. If you get Wondershare, it'll show you all these different options. It's one of the things you want to read the manuals because then you'll understand better. See, which now makes that, it nice. that's what's stressing me right there. Reading manuals, Tom. Don't, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> now, my, my techies don't even like to read the manuals. They like to figure out themselves. Exactly. But yeah, it's great and it's really intuitive because when you load Wondershare, it'll show you at the bottom of the screen all these different icons of what you want to go to. If you have no clue what you want to go to, send us an email at Ask Tom at tmcplace.com, and I'll get back to you and make some suggestions based on what your end use is. But if you're in a hurry, you don't have time to get a hold of me. If you go MP4 with video and MP3 with audio, you're going to be okay. All right. Here's one from Kathy Funk, and this is a really unique question. I, I, I don't know if you get this very often. She said, I'd like to have this movie on a Blu-ray DVD transferred to my old VHS tape because that's the only kind of player I have. Can you do this? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we can do it. We could take a Cadillac, put it in a shredder, and reformat it into a Fiesta, but why would you want to do that? 
there's sometimes people have those situations. Back in the day, we had a customer when DVDs first came out that refused to buy a DVD player. He'd bring in new DVD releases and say, hey, put this on a VHS so I can play it. And he did so many of them, he ended up spending a couple hundred dollars. And I said, hey, you can go buy a DVD player for you know, 60, 70 bucks is what they cost back then. And he says, no, I don't want it. Just do what I asked you to do. And the customer is usually right, so we did what he wanted to do. You can send us a Blu-ray. We can turn it into a VHS or an MP4, whatever you want. If you want to buy Wondershare, like we talked about the customer before, you can take the Blu-ray and convert that in Wondershare to an MP4 or to a VHS or whatever you want. But we're happy to do that for you. Sometimes old folks don't want the new technology. They love their VHS players. We're more than happy to do that for you. All right, Tom, great stuff. And, of course, if you have a question for Tom, you can email him at asktom at tmcplace.com. Thanks for coming on. We'll see you next week, Tom. Thank you. My pleasure. And this segment of the show has been brought to you by FamilySearch.org. Well, that wraps it up for this week. By the way, if you missed any of the show, catch the podcast. It comes out on Mondays after we air on the weekends on radio around the country. You can catch it on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and ExtremeGenes.com. But of course, and don't forget to sign up for the Weekly Genie Newsletter. Go to ExtremeGenes.com. You'll find the fill-in box at the upper right-hand corner of the front page. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family.